Chapter Fourteen of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. As soon as I had perused this epistle, I went to the master and informed him that his sister had arrived at the Heights and sent me a letter expressing her sorrow for Mrs. Linton's situation and her ardent desire to see him, with a wish that he would transmit to her as early as possible some token of forgiveness by me. Forgiveness? said Linton. I have nothing to forgive her, Ellen. You may call at Wuthering Heights this afternoon if you like, and say that I am not angry, but I am sorry to have lost her, especially as I can never think she'll be happy. It is out of the question my going to see her, however. We are eternally divided, and should she really wish to oblige me, let her persuade the villain she has married to leave the country. And you won't write her a little note, sir? I asked imploringly no he answered it is needless my communication with heathcliff's family shall be as sparing as his with mine it shall not exist mr edgar's coldness depressed me exceedingly and all the way from the grange i puzzled my brains how to put more heart into what he said when i repeated it and how to soften his refusal of even a few lines to console isabella i dare say she had been on the watch for me since morning I saw her looking through the lattice as I came up the garden causeway, and I nodded to her, but she drew back, as if afraid of being observed. I entered without knocking. There never was such a dreary, dismal scene as the formerly cheerful house presented. I must confess that if I had been in a young lady's place, I would at least have swept the hearth, and wiped the tables with a duster, but she already partook of the pervading spirit of neglect which encompassed her. Her pretty face was wan and listless, her hair uncurled, some locks hanging lankily down, and some carelessly twisted round her head. Probably she had not touched her dress since yester evening. Hindley was not there. Mr. Heathcliff sat at a table, turning over some papers in his pocket-book, but he rose when I appeared, asked me how I did, quite friendly, and offered me a chair. He was the only thing there that seemed decent and I thought he never looked better. So much had circumstances altered their positions that he would certainly have struck a stranger as a born and bred gentleman, and his wife as a thorough little slattern. She came forward eagerly to greet me, and held out one hand to take the expected letter. I shook my head. She wouldn't understand the hint, but followed me to a sideboard where I went to lay my bonnet, and importuned me in a whisper to give her directly what I had brought. Heathcliff guessed the meaning of her manoeuvres, and said, "'If you have got anything for Isabella, as no doubt you have, Nelly, give it to her. You needn't make a secret of it. We have no secrets between us.' "'Oh, I have nothing,' I replied, thinking it best to speak the truth at once. My master bid me tell his sister that she must not expect either a letter or a visit from him at present. He sends his love, ma'am, and his wishes for your happiness, and his pardon for the grief you have occasioned, but he thinks that after this time his household and the household here should drop into communication, as nothing could come of keeping it up. Mrs. Heathcliff's lip quivered slightly, and she returned to her seat in the window. Her husband took his stand on the hearthstone, near me, and began to put questions concerning Catherine. I told him as much as I thought proper of her illness, and he extorted from me by cross-examination most of the facts connected with its origin. I blamed her, as she deserved, for bringing it all on herself, and ended by hoping that he would follow Mr. Linton's example and avoid future interference with his family, for good or evil. "'Mrs. Linton is now just recovering,' I said. "'She'll never be like she was, but her life is spared, and if you really have a regard for her, you'll shun crossing her way again, nay, you'll move out of this country entirely, and that you may not regret it, I'll inform you Catherine Linton is as different now from your old friend Catherine Earnshaw as that young lady is different from me. Her appearance has changed greatly, her character much more so, and the person who is compelled of necessity to be her companion will only sustain his affection hereafter by the remembrance of what she once was, by common humanity and a sense of duty. That is quite possible, remarked Heathcliff, forcing himself to seem calm quite possible that your master should have nothing but common humanity and a sense of duty to fall back upon, 
but do you imagine that i shall leave catherine to his duty and humanity and can you compare my feelings respecting catherine to his before you leave this house i must exact a promise from you that you'll get me an interview with her consent or refuse i will see her what do you say i say mr heathcliff i replied you must not you never shall through my means another encounter between you and the master would kill her altogether with your aid that may be avoided he continued and should there be danger of such an event should he be the cause of adding a single trouble more to her existence why i think i shall be justified in going to extremes i wish you had sincerity enough to tell me whether catherine would suffer greatly from his loss the fear that she would restrains me and there you see the distinction between our feelings had he been in my place and i in his though i hated him with a hatred that turned my life to gall i never would have raised a hand against him you may look incredulous if you please i never would have banished him from her society as long as she desired his the moment her regard ceased i would have torn his heart out and drunk his blood but till then if you don't believe me you don't know me till then i would have died by inches before i touched a single hair of his head and yet i interrupted you have no scruples in completely ruining all hopes of her perfect restoration by thrusting yourself into her remembrance now when she has nearly forgotten you and involving her in a new tumult of discord and distress you suppose she has nearly forgotten me he said oh nelly you know she has not you know as well as i do that for every thought she spends on linton she spends a thousand on me at a most miserable period of my life i had a notion of the kind it haunted me on my return to the neighbourhood last summer but only her own assurance could make me admit the horrible idea again and then linton would be nothing nor hindley nor all the dreams that ever i dreamt two words would comprehend my future death and hell existence after losing her would be hell yet i was a fool to fancy for a moment that she valued edgar linton's attachment more than mine if he loved with all the powers of his puny being he couldn't love as much in eighty years as i could in a day and catherine has a heart as deep as i have the sea could be as readily contained in that horse trough as her whole affection be monopolized by him tush he is scarcely a degree dearer to her than her dog or her horse it is not in him to be loved like me how can she love in him what he has not catherine and edgar are as fond of each other as any two people can be cried isabella with sudden vivacity no one has a right to talk in that manner and i won't hear my brother depreciated in silence your brother is wondrous fond of you too isn't he observed heathcliff scornfully he turns you adrift on the world with surprising alacrity he is not aware of what i suffer she replied i didn't tell him that you have been telling him something then you have written have you to say that i was married i did write you saw the note and nothing since no my young lady is looking sadly the worse for her change of condition i remarked somebody's love comes short in her case obviously whose i may guess but perhaps i shouldn't say i should guess it was her own said heathcliff she degenerates into a mere slut she is tired of trying to please me uncommonly early you'll hardly credit it but the very morrow of our wedding she was weeping to go home however she'll suit this house so much the better for not being over nice and i'll take care she does not disgrace me by rambling abroad well sir returned i i hope you'll consider that mrs heathcliff is accustomed to being looked after and waited on and that she has been brought up like an only daughter whom every one was ready to serve you must let her have a maid to keep things tidy about her and you must treat her kindly whatever be your notion of mr edgar you cannot doubt that she has a capacity for strong attachments or she wouldn't have abandoned the elegancies and comforts and friends of her former home to fix contentedly in such a wilderness as this with you she abandoned them under a delusion he answered picturing in me a hero of romance and expecting unlimited indulgences from my chivalrous devotion 
i can hardly regard her in the light of a rational creature so obstinately has she persisted in forming a fabulous notion of my character and acting on the false impressions she cherished but at last i think she begins to know me i don't perceive the silly smiles and grimaces that provoked me at first and the senseless incapability of discerning that i was in earnest when i gave her my opinion of her infatuation and herself it was a marvellous effort of perspicacity to discover that i did not love her i believed at one time no lessons could teach her that and yet it is poorly learnt for this morning she announced as a piece of appalling intelligence that i had actually succeeded in making her hate me a positive labour of hercules i assure you if it be achieved i have cause to return thanks can i trust your assertion isabella are you sure you hate me if i let you alone for half a day won't you come sighing and wheedling to me again i dare say she would rather i had seemed all tenderness before you it wounds her vanity to have the truth exposed but i don't care who knows that the passion was wholly on one side and i never told her a lie about it she cannot accuse me of showing one bit of deceitful softness the first thing she saw me do on coming out of the grange was to hang up her little dog and when she pleaded for it the first words i uttered were a wish that i had the hanging of every being belonging to her except one possibly she took that exception for herself but no brutality disgusted her i suppose she has an innate admiration of it if only her precious person were secure from injury now was it not the depth of absurdity of genuine idiocy for that pitiful slavish mean-minded brat to dream that i could love her tell your master nelly that i never in all my life met with such an abject thing as she is she even disgraces the name of linton and i've sometimes relented from pure lack of invention in my experiments on what she could endure and still creep shamefully cringing back but tell him also to set his fraternal and magisterial heart at ease that i keep strictly within the limits of the law i have avoided up to this period giving her the slightest right to claim a separation and what's more she'd thank nobody for dividing us if she desired to go she might the nuisance of her presence outweighs the gratification to be derived from tormenting her mr heathcliff said i this is the talk of a madman your wife most likely is convinced you are mad and for that reason she has borne with you hitherto but now that you say she may go she'll doubtless avail herself of the permission you are not so bewitched ma'am are you as to remain with him of your own accord take care ellen answered isabella her eyes sparkling irefully there was no misdoubting by their expression the full success of her partner's endeavours to make himself detested don't put faith in a single word he speaks he's a lying fiend a monster and not a human being i've been told i might leave him before and i've made the attempt but i dare not repeat it only ellen promise you'll not mention a syllable of his infamous conversation to my brother or catherine whatever he may pretend he wishes to provoke edgar to desperation he says he has married me on purpose to obtain power over him and he shan't obtain it i'll die first i just hope i pray that he may forget his diabolical prudence and kill me the single pleasure i can imagine is to die or to see him dead there that will do for the present said heathcliff if you are called upon in a court of law you'll remember her language nelly and take a good look at that countenance she's near the point which would suit me no you're not fit to be your own guardian isabella now and i being your legal protector must retain you in my custody however distasteful the obligation may be go upstairs i have something to say to ellen dean in private that's not the way upstairs i tell you why this is the road upstairs child he seized and thrust her from the room and returned muttering i have no pity i have no pity the more the worms writhe the more i yearn to crush out their entrails it is a moral teething and i grind with greater energy in proportion to the increase of pain 
do you understand what the word pity means i said hastening to resume my bonnet did you ever feel a touch of it in your life put that down he interrupted perceiving my intention to depart you are not going yet come here now nelly i must either persuade or compel you to aid me in fulfilling my determination to see catherine and that without delay i swear that i meditate no harm i don't desire to cause any disturbance or to exasperate or insult mr linton i only wish to hear from herself how she is and why she has been ill and to ask if anything that i could do would be of use to her last night i was in the grange garden six hours and i'll return there to-night and every night i'll haunt the place and every day till i find an opportunity of entering if edgar linton meets me i shall not hesitate to knock him down and give him enough to ensure his quiescence while i stay if his servants oppose me i shall threaten them off with these pistols but wouldn't it be better to prevent my coming in contact with them or their master and you could do it so easily i'd warn you when i came and then you might let me in unobserved as soon as she was alone and watch till i departed your conscience quite calm you would be hindering mischief i protested against playing that treacherous part in my employer's house and besides i urged the cruelty and selfishness of his destroying mrs linton's tranquillity for his satisfaction the commonest occurrence startles her painfully i said she's all nerves and she couldn't bear the surprise i'm positive don't persist sir or else i shall be obliged to inform my master of your designs and he'll take measures to secure his house and its inmates from any such unwarrantable intrusions in that case i'll take measures to secure you woman exclaimed heathcliff you shall not leave wuthering heights till to-morrow morning it is a foolish story to assert that catherine could not bear to see me and as to surprising her i don't desire it you must prepare her ask her if i may come you say she never mentions my name and that i am never mentioned to her to whom should she mention me if i am a forbidden topic in the house she thinks you are all spies for her husband oh i've no doubt she's in hell among you i guess by her silence as much as anything what she feels you say she is often restless and anxious-looking is that a proof of tranquillity you talk of her mind being unsettled how the devil could it be otherwise in her frightful isolation and that insipid paltry creature attending her from duty and humanity from pity and charity he might as well plant an oak in a flower-pot and expect it to thrive as imagine he can restore her to vigour in the soil of his shallow cares let us settle it at once will you stay here and am i to fight my way to catherine over linton and his footman or will you be my friend as you have been hitherto and do what i request decide because there is no reason for my lingering another minute if you persist in your stubborn ill-nature well mr lockwood i argued and complained and flatly refused him fifty times but in the long run he forced me to an agreement i engaged to carry a letter from him to my mistress and should she consent i promised to let him have intelligence of linton's next absence from home when he might come and get in as he was able i wouldn't be there and my fellow-servants should be equally out of the way was it right or wrong i fear it was wrong though expedient i thought i prevented another explosion by my compliance and i thought too it might create a favourable crisis in catherine's mental illness and then i remembered mr edgar's stern rebuke of my carrying tales and i tried to smooth away all disquietude on the subject by affirming with frequent iteration that that betrayal of trust if it merited so harsh an appellation should be the last notwithstanding my journey homeward was sadder than my journey hither and many misgivings i had ere i could prevail on myself to put the missive into mrs linton's hand but here is kenneth i'll go down and tell him how much better you are my history is dree as we say and will serve to while away another morning dree and dreary i reflected as the good woman descended to receive the doctor and not exactly of the kind which i should have chosen to amuse me but never mind i'll extract wholesome medicines from mrs dean's bitter herbs and firstly let me beware of the fascination that lurks in catherine heathcliff's brilliant eyes 
I should be in a curious taking if I surrendered my heart to that young person, and the daughter turned out a second edition of the mother. End of chapter 14